All right, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time of day in the world, or whatever time of day you happen to be watching this video, wherever you are in the world when you are watching this video, and I hope that you guys are all doing okay and that you are surviving and that things are kind of looking up for you guys. Um, I know that for me, I'm still going a little bit stir-crazy with quarantine, but hey, you know, every day is one day closer to not having to live through this pandemic. All right, so first things first, I'm recording this as of 9.09 .09 p.m. on Sunday, April 19th, so any information that I'm giving out here today could obviously be outdated by the time you guys watch this video, although I don't really have any outdated information available for you guys except for possibly the uh, cases and the deaths. So as of this moment, there have been 1,183 residents in Mecklenburg County who have tested positive for coronavirus, and there have been 29 related deaths. Um, the second thing is that the UNC system is providing refunds for housing, dining, and parking. I know that uh, for me, I got my parking refund just a couple of days after uh, the last video that I put up last Wednesday. So I think that I probably got that, or I probably got the refund like maybe on Thursday. So make sure you check your emails or check your bank accounts, make sure all that is coming through. Uh, and the very last thing is that this is our last, um, I don't know what you would call this, like topic that we're gonna talk about in personal finance. Uh, after this, we're going to have the pick a topic, which I'm going to get to in just one moment, and then we're going to have our final exam, which I'm also going to talk about. So the big thing is that you guys will have a quiz due for consumer purchasing by Sunday at 11 p.m. There are no more grad-ready quizzes. All of that is done. You guys should have taken that. That should all be graded, um, so there's no more having to worry about that. The big thing is, is that on Canvas, under the personal finance basics section, there is a pick a topic survey for you guys to go in and tell me what you want to learn about on 422. And again, it could be whatever you guys want to learn about, um, whatever personal finance related that you guys think that you want me to cover or you want me to cover again, or anything else that you want to learn about that we haven't really covered, you can go ahead and tell me what that is. Uh, I did give you guys a couple of options. I can't remember what those options are off the top of my head, and I don't have a survey in front of me. But there is a space in there for you guys to tell me something that you want to learn about. So if I didn't give you an option and you want to learn about that, you can go ahead and plug that in. So far, only two people have responded to the survey. So, and the two people voted for two different things. So y'all, please go out and vote. Let, just let me know what you want to learn about, and I promise I will do my best to tell you as much about it as I possibly can. Uh, last thing is final exam. So I talked to Audra on Friday, and she essentially said that what's going to happen with the final exams is that there is, I mean, obviously there are going to be no in-person final exams. So your final exam is just going to be on Canvas. It'll probably work the other way that the exams have, in the, or your past two exams have. I think what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up giving like a 30-question test, and probably 15 questions will be from the first kind of two sections that we did, and 15 questions will be from this last section. So it'll be more second part of the course heavy, like post second exam heavy. Well, I don't know. I said that out loud and now I'm kind of second guessing myself, but that's kind of what I'm planning on. And what I'll probably end up doing is when I post it, I'll just leave it open for like four or five days or something like that. So you guys just kind of at your leisure can go in and take the final exam and submit your answers that way. It's probably going to all be multiple choice. Um, a, because we haven't really been doing free response questions in here, and I don't really want to spring that on you guys. And B, I don't really want to have to grade like all of your free response questions. So I imagine it'll all be just multiple choice questions. Uh, if you guys want, I can throw in like one or two, I don't know, bonus questions uh, for, or like bonus free response questions and kind of maybe give you guys some extra points that way. Uh, but you guys can just let me know on the survey for consumer purchasing uh, that. You guys will take as soon as you watch this video and let me know what you think about that. So if you have any better ideas for what the final exam might be, please let me know. I promise I'm open to ideas and we can kind of maybe work something out. But that's my idea. 30 question quiz, all multiple choice, maybe one or two bonus free response questions, and I'll leave it open for like four or five days. Um, so if that sounds good to you, let me know. If it does not sound good to you, please let me know. All right, so today for our very last topic, we are talking about consumer purchasing, uh, specifically with housing and vehicles. So general consumer purchasing. So when you are shopping, the big thing that you want to avoid is impulse buying, which is just unplanned purchasing that can result in overspending. It's kind of like if you go to the grocery store and you kind of have in your head that, oh, I'm going to spend like $50 on food this week. And then you get in there and you're like, oh, well, I should actually buy a loaf of bread. And then, oh, look, I'm going to get some peanut butter. and I'm going to get some jelly. 
you know, or something like that. Just you want to avoid unplanned purchasing because that's going to result in overspending. And then again, that just leads you straight into that debt cycle. So if you do want to buy something, uh, the best thing that you can do is consider waiting for the item to go on sale in order to get the best price. Like for example, um, now might be a really great time to like go out and try and get some winter clothes because winter is getting ready to end. And I'm sure all these stores like Macy's and Belk and whatever else are going to all put their winter clothes on sale. So now might be a good time to stock up for next winter. And as always, store brands are low-cost alternatives to famous name brand products, like buying great value paper towels versus Bounty. For me, I mean, I always kind of grew up having these sort of like name brand paper towels. And obviously when I got out on my own, um, I just started buying like store brand paper towels. I tend to shop at Harris Teeter, so I get their version, or I get Harris Teeter's version of paper towels. And generally between the store brand version and the name brand version, there really isn't that much of a difference and you can get it at a much cheaper price, which means that you can spend less money, which means you can save more money or take that uh, money that you save and spend it towards something else, like something fun like entertainment. Uh, something else to consider when you're buying is unit pricing. So unit pricing is just, essentially it says, what is the price per unit? If you ever hear the phrase like try and buy, or it's cheaper to buy something in bulk, but then you look at like a 64 ounce, I don't know, thing, and you look at like an 18 ounce thing and they're two different prices and the 64 ounce is more expensive. Well, that's because the 64 ounce, it's a larger quantity, but it's cheaper per unit price. Like, okay, like let's say paper towels. That's a great example. Uh, so let's say you're looking at a, you're looking at a three pack versus a six pack of paper towels. The six pack might be more expensive than the three pack, but it's less of a cost per unit. So like each actual individual paper towel or roll of paper towels is cheaper in the six pack than it is in the three pack. So in order, excuse me, in order to calculate a unit price, just divide that price by the number of units, uh, whatever that might be. So like ounces, excuse me, ounces, pounds, etc., And then just compare the unit prices for various uh, sizes, brands, and stores. So I give the example of a 64 ounce product costing $8.32 would be calculated by taking the 8.32, dividing it by 64, and getting 13 cents per ounce. That's just kind of an example. So typically you always wanna go for the cheapest unit pricing that you can. Even if it means you spend more money kind of in the short term, you do save money over time. So for larger kind of more expensive items, you can also look at their warranty, things like refrigerators, dishwashers, uh, when you're shopping at things like that. And a warranty, for those of you who don't know, is just a guarantee from the manufacturer and it specifies the conditions under which you can return a product or have it repaired or replaced. Like for example, my parents, they just moved and they bought a new fridge to go in their new house. Uh, they got a warranty along with their fridge. So if the fridge arrived and something and it was broken, like maybe it wasn't cooling things properly or it wouldn't turn on or it wasn't making ice or anything else like that, uh, they can call the manufacturer and they can send somebody out to take a look at it. And if the fridge is defective, they will take that uh, defective fridge away and give them a brand new fridge um, of that same exact model, just give them a brand new fridge that will actually work properly. So there is uh, an express warranty. An express warranty is created by the seller and has two forms, a full warranty and a limited warranty. A full warranty states that a defective product can be fixed or replaced during a reasonable amount of time. Whatever that reasonable amount of time might be, like, I don't know, six months, two years or something like that. So it's not like you can take a 20 year old fridge and call up the manufacturer and say, hey, your fridge is busted and I want you to replace it. They're gonna say, well, that happens after 20 years. So a limited war warranty covers only certain aspects of the product, like parts um, that require, or I'm not, I'm sorry. Okay, so a limited war warranty only covers certain parts or, or certain aspects of a product like parts. So for example, let's say you get a brand new fridge and the fridge isn't working. If you don't have a full warranty and you have a limited warranty, it could be something like where the manufacturer says, well, we'll replace, you know, certain hoses from the fridge or we'll replace the electrical cord from the fridge, but we are not going to replace the whole fridge. So an implied warranty covers a product's intended use or other basic understandings that are not in writing. Uh, so for example, like an implied warranty of a uh, title indicates that the seller has the right to sell the product. An implied warranty of mercantility guarantees that the product is fit for the ordinary uses for which is intended. That's a really, really long way of saying that a toaster has to toast bread and an MP3 player has to play music. You can't sell a toaster that's going to toast bread and somebody gets it and they plug it in and it like, 
I don't know, makes the bread really cold or like turns it into ice or uncooks the bread. Uh, you can't do that. It's implied that the product that you are selling should actually perform what you say that it can. So if you're selling somebody a toaster, it better toast bread. Uh, if you're selling somebody an MP3 player, it better sell, or it better uh, be able to play music. So service contracts are sometimes called extended warranties. Uh, they're agreements between a business and a consumer to cover repair costs, but they are not actually warranties. Um, for a fee, these agreements protect the buyer from high servicing costs resulting in repairs. So it's kind of like optional warranties. You can think of it like that. Uh, like, for example, when I got my cell phone. Um, did I actually? Okay, well, anyways, let's say you were buying a cell phone. Um, you might be able to get some type of service contract where after, like, let's say six months or between that six months, if your phone isn't working correctly, you might be able to go back to the seller or whether, you know, whether that's like Apple or Android or wherever else and get them to fix your phone if something is wrong with it. Um, as always, you want to be aware of service contracts that offer coverage for three years but uh, really only cover two since the item has a manufacturer's one year two, or one year warranty. So they might say it covers three years, but it's really only two years. It's just kind of a gimmick that people can use to get you guys to get into a service contract. And you, know, you might think that, oh, like, oh, I have four years of protection on this item when really you only have three because that service contract is really only for two years. Just kind of a sales gimmick. So transitioning now into buying motor vehicles. So there are four steps into buying a motor vehicle that uh, you guys need to take or consider before you ever buy a car, or if maybe your parents like gave you a car and you turned 16, in which case, lucky you, um, and maybe you're ready to like get a new car at some point. These are kind of some steps that you can take to make sure that you make the best choice, the best choice possible. So phase one of this whole cycle is uh, pre-shopping activity. So number one, you have to actually identify what your problem is. Um, like, so I have up here, is your problem that you need a car or that you actually just need transportation? So for example, let's say that um, you're living in a big city and you just got a, you just moved to a big city and you got a job and you need to be able to get from your home to your job. So the most obvious way that you can do that is through a car, but you don't really need the car if you're just going to and from work, you just need transportation. Well, if you live in a big city like, I don't know, London or New York City or maybe even Charlotte, there are public transportation options. Like in New York and London, you can take the subway and in Charlotte, you can take the public transportation system. We have buses. Uh, you can also do something like Uber or Lyft or, you know, whatever else. You could also just walk to your job if your job is close enough. So make sure that when you are actually buying a car that you're identifying that you need a car. It's not just that you need transportation, because if you just need transportation, well, there are some, some alternatives that are actually out there. So you always want to consider your alternatives when you buy a car, because if you're not in a good position to maybe like afford a, a nice car and be able to maintain a car, as soon as you get that car, you're going to find very quickly that it just sucks up all your money. So once you've identified that your problem is actually that you need a car, you can go ahead and just start gathering information. And I always think of uh, Peter Baelish from Game of Thrones saying, knowledge is power. That's what kind of what information gathering is. So once you decide that you uh, need a car, just go ahead and like research all of the options that you need, like, or all of the options that are available to you. Like, what brands do you like? What kind of cars do you like? Do you like a four-door car or a two-door car? Do you want like a really big SUV? Do you want a smaller compact car? Uh, once you decide that, what brand do you want to go for? Do you want to go for a Ford or Toyota or Chevrolet? And let's say you decide to go for Ford. Well, you know, what kind of car do you want from Ford? Do you want like uh, God, I don't even know what brands Ford or Ford offers anymore. But like, you know, there's a Ford Escort. Uh, there's a Ford Explorer. There's, I think there's like a car now called the Ford Edge. You know, something like that. What kind of things do you like? You know, what do you need? What appeals to you? Uh, and ultimately, what do other people say about the cars that you like? So what are their reviews? Do they get really good mileage? Uh, are they very easily damaged? Like, you know, does an acorn fall on your car and it's totaled? That might be something you want to consider. And you can also ask like family and friends, what kind of cars do they drive? What do they like about their cars? What do they not like about their cars? What do they recommend? Just the better informed that you can that you are, the better buying decisions you guys make. So after you've identified that you actually need a car, what you need in a car, and what brands you like, and what the reviews are for it, you can think about how you're actually going to purchase the car. Um, do you want to buy it, uh, the car brand new? And if so, from what dealer? Do you want to buy it used? And if so, do you want to buy it privately uh, 
like, I don't know, from your next door neighbor, for example, or do you want to buy it from a place like CarMax? Because no matter where or wherever you go, you're going to get a different price. So when you're comparing used vehicles, well, I guess I should probably say this first. So buying a used car is a really good option if you don't have a ton of money to spend on a car. Like for me, my very first car was uh, used. My second car after that was also a used car. And I mean, it's just because like I don't have, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to drop on a brand new car. Because the average new or the average used car talk or bleh, the average used car costs about ten thousand dollars less than the average new car. So when you are looking at buying a used car, there are different places you can go to. So you can actually go to like a new like a standard new car dealership, and they can offer like late model vehicles and you know vehicles uh, that people maybe only drove for like a month and then will return to them because they didn't like them for whatever reason. And that's probably like the It'll probably be the nicest used car that you will ever get, but it, it also comes with a very, very high price. There are also used car dealerships. Um, okay, yeah, so you, there are like used car dealerships, things like CarMax, for example. I just, for a second, I thought I didn't actually put the CarMax logo on the screen. I got scared. So used car dealerships like uh, CarMax, they offer older vehicles. Sometimes they will offer warranties, but they're generally limited warranties, and you might get some kind of lower prices than you would at a new car dealership, but it's still going to be pretty pricey. Like I'd say, if you're willing to spend ten, eleven thousand dollars on CarMax for, or like on a used car, for example, CarMax might be a really good place to go. Uh, you can also just go, uh, just go privately, like through individuals selling their own cars. So you're probably going to get the cheapest car available here at this point, uh, but it may not be the most well maintained, well maintained car. Because when you go to a place like, I don't know, Ford to buy a used car or CarMax to buy a used car, those cars typically have to go through some type of inspection process to make sure they're not just like buying a hunk of junk. You know, versus if you buy a car from Joe from down the street, you know, you have no idea how well that car was maintained. Um, and you literally could just be buying a hunk of junk and Joe from down the street could be scamming you. Um, there are such things as certified pre-owned cars. So they're nearly new cars that come from the original manufacturer, that come with the original manufacturer's guarantee, and they go through a rigorous inspection and repair process. If you guys have never purchased a car before and you are looking into purchasing your very first car, I personally recommend that you go for a used vehicle. And I would not recommend that you go to a place like Ford to buy a used car because if you're just going to get a ton of money, what I, you know, me personally recommend is I recommend going to CarMax and seeing what their prices are. And if they're still out of your price range, go ahead and look on like Craigslist for cars. And what I did when I bought the car that I have now, uh, which, and I bought that car used, I bought it privately through an individual, is I just told the guy like, hey, I have this mechanic and I want you to take the car to the mechanic and have him inspect it and I'll pay for it. And then the mechanic inspected it, I paid the bill, and then he gave me a call and he said like, here's what I found out about the car. Here are a couple of things that I noticed about it that are wrong with it but you know, overall it's an X amount of shape. So that's a way that you can kind of buy a car from an individual private seller and still feel like you know, you're getting a good deal out of it and you're not just buying a hunk of junk. So when you're checking out a used car, here's kind of like a cheat sheet that you can use. I just I went ahead and stole this from your textbook because I think this is really good. So outside the car, you know, obviously you want to look for like dents, signs of accidents. Um, Trunk and tire space, tire or tire tread wear, excuse me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Inside the car, you want to make sure that you know your pedals are working, that your steering wheel is working. You know, if there's a radio, make sure that that's working. Make sure that the engine starts okay. Radio, wipers, heater, AC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, make sure that you sort of drive the car around for a little bit. Do like a test drive. Uh, most places, like I know, at CarMax will let you test drive the car. They'll just have like some type of big loop or that you drive around the parking lot uh, and just kind of get a feel for the drive or get a feel for the car as you're driving it. You can also lease a motor vehicle. You can actually lease a car. Uh, the main advantages of leasing a car are number one, you only need a small security deposit uh, versus where you're going to buy a car like, you know, either brand new or from a place like CarMax where you can maybe get some financing. Uh, you're pretty much have to put down like a large down payment, which you may not have. Um, and monthly lease payments are actually a little bit lower than monthly financing payments. Um, lease agreements provide detailed records for business purposes. 
So if you ever want to like, so if you get into some type of disagreement with the company that you're leasing the car from, you do have that piece of paper there that sort of outlines everything. And when you, or if you decide to take them to court or meet with a lawyer, there, it very explicitly states in the, in the contract, you know, whose responsibility is whose. And generally when you're leasing a car, you can probably afford a more expensive car than you would be able to if you're just buying a car normally. Um, the major drawbacks include obviously that you don't uh, own the car and you have to meet certain requirements in order to require for leasing the car, similar to like applying for credit for credit or like applying for an apartment complex. Um, you just have to meet certain requirements. And there are other additional uh, costs that come with the car, like, I don't know, certain repairs, returning the car in early, or, you know, if you move to another state, like let's say you move to Vermont, you may not be able to take the car with you and you'll have to turn the car back in, at which point you might incur some other type of fee. So once you've sort of picked out the car that you like, you've decided, uh, you know, what you want in a car, you know what you want, you know what the reviews are, you know how you're going to purchase the car, uh, you can go ahead and kind of determine the purchase price. So in most cases, you can actually negotiate for a lower price. That isn't always the case. Like I think, and you guys can't quote me on this, but I think like a CarMax, they don't negotiate at all. Their price is just that price. Uh, but like I know that new car dealerships, you can absolutely negotiate. So just make sure that when you are negotiating, A, that you have all the information about the car and that you actually are speaking to a person that has the authority to give you a lower price, like a business owner or a store manager or something. You're not just like talking to a clerk who has no effect on the price. So when you're buying a used car, um, and whether that's from a place like, I don't know, CarMax, if they are actually doing negotiations or just individually, so just make sure that you check ads for prices that are comparable vehicles. Uh, you can use Edmunds used car prices or the Kelly Blue Book. I personally recommend Kelly Blue Book. I think that's really good. When I bought the car that I have now, I use Kelly Blue Book and I was uh, just kind of talked to the guy that I bought it from and I was able to negotiate. I think I'm, I think I got him down about a thousand dollars. So that's something you can do. Uh, if you're going to buy a brand new car, the sticker price, um, just keep in mind that when you're going and you're going to get a brand new car, the sticker price for that car represents the base price for the car with cost of added, of added features. Uh, the reverse of that is that the dealer's cost or the invoice price is an amount less than the sticker price. And the difference between the sticker price and the dealer's cost is the range available for negotiation. So like dealer's cost is what it actually costs the dealer to get that car in the dealership. The sticker price just sort of represents the maximum amount of profit that they think they can get for the car. So for example, let's say that, you know, the, the dealer's cost was $20,000 and the sticker price is $30,000. So you can negotiate between 20 and $30,000. Generally you might have to compromise and you'll come to something like 25, 26, $27,000. And that can be sort of the price for the new car. Again, making sure that you have all the information, you can bring things like ads from other dealers that say, Hey, I can get this other car or I can get the same exact car at this dealership for a lower price, or I can get a car that's very similar to this car at another dealership for this price, things of that nature. Just keeping in mind that if you do actually try and bargain for a brand new car, that these salespeople are salespeople and negotiating is literally their job. So you want to make sure that you do all of their research so you don't end up looking like an idiot. And finally, phase four is just post-purchase activities. And it's just remembering um, that for cars, you have to regularly maintain them. So make sure you regularly take them to the mechanic, make sure they repair any damage, things like an oil leak. And keeping in mind that in North Carolina, you have to have your car inspected every 12 months after purchasing it to make sure that it's still safe to drive. And switching gears, oh, that was kind of, that was a pun. So switching gears into housing. Um, so when deciding on how you're gonna spend your money on housing, you have a few different options available to you. So most people will probably rent an apartment or a small home when they're first starting out, like just leaving their parents' house, but it's not uncommon to at some point want to purchase your very own home. So when you decide to purchase a home, you have options available to you. You can buy a brand new home, you can buy a renovated home, you can buy a fixer upper home, and all of those come with certain advantages. Uh, I also stole this graphic from your book because again, I think it was a really good graphic. So you can kind of see the disadvantages and advantages of sort of every stage. So like, you know, renting an apartment, renting a house, owning a new house, uh, owning a previously owned house, they all have similarly good advantages. Like, an advantage to a new, uh, to owning a brand new house is that you probably know that everything in that house is gonna work perfectly. 
because everything is brand new. Uh, but you're going to pay top dollar for that brand new house. Versus if you're going to buy like a previously owned house or a fixer upper, you can get it at a really cheap cost, but you have to sink a bunch of money into the house in order to get it into a livable state. And I mean, if you guys have ever seen those like home fixer upper shows, they always find like mold or asbestos in the walls or something that costs them an extra $8,000 to end up taking out. So if you're going to decide to rent an apartment or rent a home or just rent in general, so the, you do have a couple of advantages. So number one, renting an apartment offers very, very high mobility. So like, let's say right now you're living in Charlotte and then tomorrow you get a call uh, to go get a job out in like Colorado, let's say. You can just go talk to your apartment complex and you can say, I'll pay you out for the rest of the money for the lease that I owe you. I'm going to go move to Colorado real quick. And it makes relocation very, very easy. Also, when you rent, you have fewer responsibilities than, homeowner, than homeowners do uh, because you don't actually own the apartment. Um, like, for example, okay, it's so like the other day, my dishwasher was having a problem. My dishwasher in my apartment wasn't draining anymore. And if I own the home, that meant I own the dishwasher and I would actually have to repair that myself. But because I was renting the apartment, I was able to just call the leasing office and they sent somebody out here to unclog my dishwasher and make sure that it would drain, and it came with no additional cost to me. So you have fewer responsibilities when it comes to like apartment upkeep, uh, and that also leads to like lower initial costs. So the couple of disadvantages is number one, there aren't a lot of financial benefits to running. Um, I mean, for me, like I'm kind of at the point in my life right now running my apartment, I feel like I'm just throwing away money every single month, um, and it kind of irritates me a little bit. And also, you know, when you do rent, you are subject to like rent increases. Like if my apartment complex came in tomorrow and said, you know, your rent is going to go up by $200 a month. There's not really anything that I can do about it. And you also have a restrictive lifestyle when you rent. So, you know, you may not be able to have, um, you know, parties with uh, X number of people in them. Like there might be a limit to, like your landlord might say, you can't have a party with more than 10 people in your apartment at one time. Uh, they also might say, you can't have a pet in your apartment at any time. You can't paint the walls, you can't replace the floorboards, you can't tear up the carpet and put down hardwoods, uh, things of that nature. So you're very, very restricted and it's again because you don't actually own the place that you're living in. So when you do uh, go out and rent, generally you have to have a security deposit. The security deposit is about a one month's rent, just kind of give or take, and just covers any damages uh, that occurs after you, go, after you move out. So like, let's say, I don't know, your security deposit was $1,000, you lived in an apartment for two years, you moved out, and there was $200 worth of damage to the apartment. So they'll go ahead and take that $200 from that security deposit, put that into the apartment, and return the extra $800 to you. Uh, however, if you do not want to rent and you actually want to buy, there is a home buying process. So there are benefits to home ownership. So number one is just pride of ownership. And the idea is that it's a very stable place of residence and you get to have uh, some type of like personalized living. You know, if you buy a house and you want to paint the walls blue, you can paint the walls blue. If you want to put down carpet, put down carpet. You want to tear carpet up, tear up carpet. Um, it is yours to do with as you please. And there are also financial benefits to owning a home. Uh, and one benefit that I listed here is you can deduct mortgage, mortgage interest and real estate tax payments on your federal income taxes. Um, and another potential benefit is increases in the value of property. So you could do something like home flipping. Um, like let's like you could buy a house for $300,000 and property values, for whatever reason, just skyrocket. And when you're ready to sell your home, you can sell it for $600,000. Well, you just doubled the price of your home. You just made $300,000. And while you have to pay taxes on it, it's still a lot of money. You also get a very, very flexible lifestyle because you can have parties, you can paint walls, you can have pets, you can, again, just kind of do whatever you want. It offers a very, very flexible kind of lifestyle. The drawbacks are number one, you do have financial uncertainty. So things like if the economy crashes and property values uh, tank, that'd be an example of financial uncertainty. Uh, coming up with a down payment for a house, that's an example of financial uncertainty. You also have very limited mobility, like let's say right now you have a home in Charlotte and you get your dream job out in Denver, Colorado. Uh, you're going to have to stay here and sell your home, and that's going to be a process. You have to get the home inspected. You have to have it appraised. You might have to do some type of repairs on your home, like paint the walls and you know mop the floors and do kind of just 
or like re replace a force, things that you wouldn't normally do. So home ownership also has higher living costs because you own the home. Like if I owned this, uh, the place that I'm living in right now, which is an apartment, and my dishwasher broke, I'm responsible for my dishwasher. Um, if you know a tree falls on my home, I'm responsible for it. So there is a little bit more risk and there is a little bit more or increased costs or increased living costs when it comes to actually owning a home. Um, when you do get a home, you also need to get a mortgage, insur mortgage insurance or private mortgage insurance, which is a PMI. And it's usually required if you can't get a down payment of less than 20% of whatever the purchase price is for that home. Um, so the idea is that the coverage protects the bank, the bank from financial loss if you actually fail to pay off your debt. And, you know, if your home maybe like decreases in value to the point where it's no longer worth what you still owe. Uh, so PMI charges, which you pay, uh, they're going to vary depending on the amount of the down payment as well as your credit score. So obviously the higher your credit score, the lower the PMI charge. So these costs may be paid in full at the end of a closing or spread monthly over the life of the mortgage. Keeping in mind that mortgages are usually for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Um, nowadays, it's generally between 15 and 30. So if you are going to apply for a home, there are three steps that you have to go through. So number one is pre-qualification, and you have to just complete a mortgage application, provide evidence of employment, income, assets, liabilities. The bank will get a credit score report, um, and then they'll either approve or deny you for the mortgage. And if you do get approved, you'll get a piece of paper with a maximum amount of money that they're willing to lend you. Uh, you also have a fee payment, and you have to obtain some type of commitment. So at this point, banks will likely charge a fee that may be as high as $500. And the idea is that it just locks in uh, your home rate. So whatever the interest rate is for your home at that uh, particular time. So like, let's say, for example, I don't know, you go to the bank on Monday and your interest rate on your mortgage is 5%. And you're like, well, that's ridiculous. So you go back to the bank on Tuesday and their interest rates are now only 4%. So that would be an example of like maybe trying to wait it out a little bit, talking to the banker and see if interest rates might drop. So you can make sure that you get the lowest interest rate possible on your actual mortgage. Yeah. Finding a property that you desire to purchase. So finding a home uh, that you actually want to live in, that you can afford, and making sure that you get an appraisal of the home, you get the home inspected, um, and that it's actually what you want to end up, or that it is, it is actually what you want to buy. So that leads us to the end of this. It is currently, whoops, I don't have my watch on, look at my phone. It is 9.44 on, is it 4.19? Yeah, okay, so it is actually 4.19. So the big thing to remember is that you have your consumer purchasing quiz uh, due Sunday at 11, and please, please, please go onto Canvas, select what you wanna, wanna learn about on 4.22 because I have to make the PowerPoint uh, tomorrow and two or I'm gonna work on the PowerPoint tomorrow and Tuesday and I want to make sure that I'm gonna talk about something that you guys want to learn about I mean this is your opportunity to just have me talk about whatever you want me to talk about um, so yeah that's it this is the I get well I guess it's the technically well it's the last formal topic of personal finance and the second to last topic in general so keeping in mind to do your consumer purchasing quiz make sure that you guys put on canvas and make sure you tell me what your thoughts are about the final exam. If you're okay with my idea, just having like some multiple choice questions, uh, maybe possibly one or two for your response bonus questions. Um, just let me know what your thoughts are on that. And I guess I will talk to you guys on Wednesday. Yeah, have a good evening everyone, or a good morning or a good afternoon or a good rest of your day, whatever time of day you happen to be watching this.